Marcus Carey, the founder and CEO of ThreatCare, actually grew up in Texas with very little access to technology, but that changed when he joined the Navy and went into cryptology. While serving the country, Marcus worked with the most advanced tech in the world, and when his service time was finished, he stayed in the field working in various government agencies for a number of years. At ThreatCare, Marcus applies the lessons he's learned along the way to help his customers secure their data and test their cybersecurity. In this interview, he and Ian talk about what it means to be a white hat hacker versus a black hat hacker, creating automated technology, and finding your superpower. This podcast is sponsored by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps. Okay, so first question. How did you get that awesome profile picture? Because uh, I heard that it was through a mutual friend that's a really cool guy. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm play. uh, <laughs> no, just playing. Play. Dude, I was thinking about that. I was, I was looking at your picture. I was like, I was there for that. It's like, I was there when that yeah. photo of his face was being shot. <laughs> pretty funny. That's true, man. Hey, I appreciate you, bro. <laughs> no, no. Man, you, you part, hey, you're part of the story, man. <laughs> yeah, that's no, awesome. I, I, I'll, I'll take credit for, uh, I'll take credit for getting on a call with you and being like, you got to get, you got to get to Palo Alto or wherever the hell we were. San Mateo. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, where'd you grow up? I grew up in a small town called Marlin, Texas. I was between Marlin and Waco, Texas. But Marlin is, is where I was born. I was born in my grandmother's house. Uh, I'm a country boy. I tell people when I come in a room, thank God I'm a country boy starts playing. Uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> so uh, in that small town, you know, I, I really appreciate coming from a small town. I was always working with my hands and stuff and trying to build stuff because you had nothing to do out there but, but do stuff like that. I graduated from Waco High. Waco High is the, the closest like city near near Marlin. Uh, the town I was born in is about six thousand people, but we moved to Waco and I graduated from Waco High. Waco is actually a pretty big city. You know, people don't understand. Is uh, well, I mean, it's over three hundred, four hundred thousand in the county, so it's a pretty good sized place. And Baylor University is there. Yeah. No, I've so, I've driven uh, through. It's, it's like, there's so many towns like that in Texas that are like way bigger than you thought. I mean, I remember, you know, Houston's obviously absolutely enormous, but I remember mm-hmm. my first time going through Texas and I was like, man, I can't believe like small, like Lubbock and all these things. You're like, these are these tiny towns. Like, not really. They're actually pretty huge. Uh, and, and so, yeah, but it's funny because, you know, the David Koresh thing happened in Waco and every time you hear Waco on the news, it's usually crazy. Yep. So people think it's a little bit smaller than uh, what, what it is. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm from. I'm from that area. I was born 19 miles outside of the, out of Waco. So I grew up around uh, that, that area and that culture and the Bible belt culture kind of, kind of thing. So did you have a bunch of technology around you, a bunch of computers? Like what, uh, what was it like? So I grew up the poorest person I knew. <laughs> I grew up outside the city limits, so th- there was no no projects or nothing like that. I was born in my grandmother's house. When I was born, there was an outhouse, propane tank. You know, they didn't have running sewage into the place. They had water, wood burning stove, all that stuff. That's that's how I was born. I was born like a lot of people down south in these rural areas, and so no, you know, not a lot of technology at all. But I was I was fortunate enough to. You know, I'm blessed because I'm, I'm pretty smart. And so I was blessed to be gifted and talented classes ever since I was in the first grade. I, can, I remember going to the classes and that actually gave me some access to technology. I remember programming on, on apples way back in the day and uh, in high school, I took programming. I was always attracted to technology, and but I just didn't have the access to the technology. If I had the technology, the technology I had was super old. Uh, that changed when I when I was 18. I joined the military. I went into the cryptography field, and so I did signals intelligence and all kind of crazy stuff for the Navy and working at the NSA. And that changed my life. It gave me access to 
a lot of stuff. And so that's, that's kind of like where I, that's kind of where I learned a lot. And I'm a sponge. So working at NSA and working around the intelligence community, that's how I got a head start. Tell me about your time with the Navy. So, I mean, as someone who, who went into the, uh, into the army and, and I was involved in recruiting towards my, towards my end of my career, you know, the cryptography stuff, you gotta be a pretty smart guy or gal to be able to get into that. What was that like? Like what was basic training like for you? I mean, not like literal basic training, but what was that training like for you, for someone who was excited about computers, but didn't have state of the art stuff. And then you're going into literally the most secret classification. I mean, did you have to get a top secret? Like what, what happened? What's funny about how I came into the Navy, I did well on as uh, the military entrance entrance exam. And so taking that as the, my, my recruiter was like surprised because I scored really high on it. And so I had two options. I had, I had an option to do cryptography or nuclear power plant stuff. And yeah, I wanted too. to work. I, I had both yeah. those options too. No, I'm totally kidding. I did not. <laughs> so, but I, I told my recruiter, I, I want to work with computers. And so they looked at the job description for what I was going to do. Cryptologic technician communications is what the the job was. And it was like, yeah, we think there's computers involved here, but we're not sure because it's classified. (laughs) So, like, even what I did was kind of classified. It was the funniest thing ever. And my my recruiter was not. Your recruiters didn't know if the technology, because it was classified. That's pretty great. Yeah, and so I'm like, wow, that's that's crazy. Yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> so I went to boot camp just like everybody else, and then you go to you go to Pensacola, Florida to get training, and so from from there, like like I said, you have access to systems that that don't even exist in the real world at that time. It's a little bit different now because when I entered, it was 1993. And so the technology I had at my disposal uh, working in in the classified IC world, we had stuff like Twitter back then where you could talk to anybody in the world at any time. So it's funny because Twitter is like some of the systems we had, we had back then for in the intelligence community. I could talk to anybody at any time, you know, pick up the phone, talk to anybody in the world, you know, inside the IC. So it was just a, we had technology. We had we had some of the first routers, firewalls, whatever. Like all the technology that, that that's not even in the organization right now. I had access to it in 1993. That's wild. What was that like? Like, what did it feel like to have all this stuff at your disposal in this military kind of world where you're just all of a sudden in it every day, right? Like you just every single day you're just you wake up and you're immersed in this technology. I mean, was it just a super fast learning curve? What did that feel like? I mean, as you know, the military is definitely about uh, being able to quickly learn and pick stuff up. One moment I'm in the hood with my, with my friends. Five months later, I have the highest clearance in, in the land with, because, because I did cryptography and communications. We even had like all the caveats and all the special access. Like we could see anything because the, the messages came by us we actually process the information. And so we knew everything. We could read any report, whatever. So so going from not being a part of any kind of intelligence apparatus, the five months later, you have the highest clearance in the land. You're helping defend the country. Uh, and, and what NSA people call it is it's, it's the silent service. We just do what we do. And you don't, you know, back then, and you don't, you don't really hear about it, but now everybody knows what it is. You know, everybody understands kind of knows what NSA does. But back then, 1993, it was like super quiet, super silent. And then you had stuff like intermediate state come out and all that. Yep. I felt like I was living in the future, man. Like it was crazy, bro. Going from zero computers to all the computers that you could possibly want want to, and having, you know, administrative rights, just learning all this stuff. Every day it was like, it was like nerd heaven. (laughs) (laughs) You spent eight years with the NSA and other federal agencies? So I did eight and a half years doing a combination of Naval Security Group and the Naval Security Group. And a lot of people don't know this, but there's NSA, full name is NSA CSS. 
And so CSS piece is all the the military, you can call it attaches, like so naval security group is this in the CSS, right? So basically eight and a half years my whole time in the Navy was I was a pretty much a, like an NSA IC asset. Then I got out and I worked for a contractor uh, for a long time too that also was a government contractor. So I supported the agency and other government people. So I, I mean, throughout my time, I worked at NSA. I worked, did some work with DIA. I did some work with DARPA. So, I mean, I'm a country boy, but born in my grandmother's house, outhouse, propane tank. And I went from that to working at all these government agencies. And so it's in, in like, like high tech agencies where I was building stuff and like writing bleeding head kind of stuff and testing stuff. It was bizarre, man. And so when I would call back home and try to talk to my friends, we were on two different playing fields. Like, because I'm like in the Intel community where I know what's going on. For instance, like when a Rwanda tragedy was going on in Africa, I would call home and I was like, man, that's messed up. What's going on in Rwanda? And my friend's like, Rwanda? Who's Rwanda? I don't know her. <laughs> you know? And it's like, that was like, wow, I'm in a totally different world <laughs> right now than what I grew up in. <laughs> so it was crazy. How did you come about being a self-described like white hat hacker? I kind of describe the difference a little bit between like what's a black hat, what's white hat, like what and where did you kind of fit into that? I think that the white hat hacker mentality is built from a young age where you're trying to the curious people that like to take stuff apart, like to break stuff and and that curiosity. And the curiosity actually leads you to understand you want to understand how things work internally and so i would say the white hat mentality is just trying to understand how everything works a good example of this i think uh, leonardo da vinci was like one of the first white hat hackers that lived because he was fascinated with how everything works even the human body the muscles the everything how how nature acts how birds move how birds fly And so I think it's that curiosity that you don't necessarily have to be a white hat computer hacker, but it's that same kind of mentality where you want to understand how stuff works and you're able to take it apart and all that stuff. And so I think that that's the white hat hacker mentality. And I think a lot of people are kind of born with that curiosity. And so that, that is a hacker mentality. And when you apply that, that white hat hacker mentality to to life and, and the computers, like, you, you're helping fix things ultimately. And that's what the difference between a white hat and a black hat uh, is to me, is that a white hat is trying to figure out, oh, this lock, it could be a physical lock. This is how you circumvent that lock. And, and a white hat would say, hey, lock manufacturer, can you please fix the, fix the lock? And so a black hat, instead of telling the manufacturer to fix the lock, they would figure out a way to, to scheme of that, that vulnerability, like, okay, cool, this lock doesn't work. I figured that out. So I can just break in all these houses and steal the stuff. So <laughs> that's the difference between a white hat and a black hat. And so on a computer side, we, we like to find weaknesses, you know, the white hat perspective. We find weaknesses in, in process. We find weaknesses in the people and the technology. And what we do with that is we help try to improve all those different things. Or a black hat will try to exploit those things. A black hat will try to exploit the human through social engineering or phishing. They would try to exploit the technology and try to try to download records that they shouldn't be able to do. That's actually the difference between a white hat and a black hat. It's the same skill set, but used in a different way. It kind of reminds me of G.I. Joe back in the day. There was a, there was a, a ninja that dressed up in white and a ninja that dressed up in black, and they were mortal enemies. It's like the yeah. yin and yang, all right? That's black hat and white hat. Uh, I'll brag on you a little bit. You're a brilliant guy. You had all of these skills and you had this desire to do something with these and to create a company around this. When did this first inkling kind of happen that you wanted to turn all of this knowledge and all of these ideas and all these things that you had into something that could help millions of people. I mean, because obviously you were helping millions of people, 
you know, with your work with federal agencies. But what was that impetus where you wanted to start your own thing to go off on your own? I think that a lot of creative people kind of like want to do it their own way because they see there's a different way to do it. And I think that any creative person, whether they're even moonlighting, doing what they love and what they're passionate about, they want to have a pure expression of what they believe. I'm certainly like a creative type person, but like ever since I was little, I made stuff. Even if it was wood, if it was whatever it may have been, like anything hanging around the house, if I had a wood and a hammer and I was going to find some nails and I was going to build something, it could have been a bench or whatever. I always like to build stuff and invent stuff. I'm 43, so I used to be a fan of like, when I was growing up, uh, MacGyver, the A-Team, how they, these people built stuff and they had their own little crew. And so that's like, man, I want to do that one day, right? <laughs> and so I kind of I kind of see myself in that sense of, I want to be creative. I want to, I want to find a better way to, to, to solve the problem that exists out there in the world. And so that's kind of like what, Ultimately, I think that if you're super creative, you want to do it your way. As far as like you think you have a unique way of addressing the problem. And that's what led me ultimately that curiosity and all that stuff. The same thing, that whole white hat hacker mentality is how can I, how can I build this myself? And so the difference between you doing it for the government and I, and I actually have a lot of friends that still or kind of like in high places now, funny enough, as we get older, everybody keeps on, you know, getting promoted. And, and I have people that are good friends of mine that are like really high ranking government people now. And I was having a conversation. I was like, man, I wonder what my life would be like if I was still at the agency and doing stuff because I, I was actually doing some cool stuff there. And, you know, my friend told me, he said, man, you're making a difference out there right now because, you know, we, we provide national security. They see me like making positive influences in, in security and uh, I mentor a lot. So you're affecting a lot of lives and all that stuff. So I think that wherever you are, you can find a way to serve the people that, you know, whether it be the military or as a civilian, find what you're passionate about and go out there and build something. And that's kind of like, that's how I roll. I mean, you've known me for a while. So, you know, I'm just trying to build what I have that, that I have. And, and it's actually turned out pretty cool. You know, I mean, we've, we've known each other for a handful of years. And from the moment that I met you, I knew that you were just like a genuine guy and that you really, you had these superpowers, you know, people may talk like a lot, especially in Silicon Valley, about like this, like idea of like, what are your superpowers? Like, how do you get those? You have these superpowers of being able to create these things that nobody can create. And it's funny because from the moment that I met you, all you wanted to do was get them out into the world. You're like, I just want this stuff out. Like I want the stuff that's on my machine to be on everybody's machines because I know that this can make a difference. However that gets to those people, I need to be able to fuel this, this thing to get out there. And I always just like love the fact that you were just relentless about figuring out a way to solve that problem. But along the way, you had some setbacks. Like you had some things that you had to do you had to fire a few people. You had to do stuff like that. Can you talk about like some of the lows of, you know, you start your own business and then you realize like, man, this is its own challenge. Oh, certainly. In the early days of, of the company, uh, when I first started, I was super technical. I was a solo founder and I got funding, which is super rare because investors usually invest in teams. But I knew that I had to build a team and build a team early. And so what a lot of people told me, since I was super technical, that I needed to hire uh, CEOs. So I actually hired CEOs twice in the first two years, and it didn't work out super well. So basically what the setback was is like, I mean, I think you have to learn and stuff, but I didn't think I was a CEO <laughs> internally. Yeah. So I thought I was like the tech person, and I needed, I needed a CEO. And so I think I needed to learn, so that was a good two years to learn. But it was a setback as far as the company goes. So I went to the Techstars program two years ago, and and I learned that oh snap, I'm you know I am a CEO. <laughs> so that was actually I knew it, a. Buddy. <laughs> that's like a 
it was some kind of mental block where I thought that, oh, I'm a CTO, I build technology. But now I'm I'm like totally embracing, all right, cool. I'm I'm a leader and I'm gonna do it kind of like I wanna do what I was called to do, essentially. So the big setback was not having that confidence initially. And that's something that I have confidence now. And and every day I, I kinda grow more confident than, than what I'm what I'm doing. So if you're out there with imposter syndrome and all that stuff, I can tell you that that's absolutely normal. And you're probably way more awesome than you think you are. Yeah, I love it. It's uh, it's something, you know, when we when we first met and you showed me your computer and you're like, man, look at this stuff that I'm working on. And I was like, holy crap, this is so, this is so interesting and so cool. And you were just relentless with figuring out a way to make this work. And I think it's, it's one of the thing that every great CEO and founder at the end of the day, you have to be relentless and pushing towards this thing that you believe. What is it that you believe about technology and cybersecurity that you want to see in the world? What's the kind of, you know, for to, to use a cliche, what's the dent that you want to make? Dang, man. Um, <laughs> that's a big question. Yeah, well, I mean, we so can just I, roll I, with it, yeah. No, 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 I'm good. That's a deep question, and I'm going to answer it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll try to answer it. I'll try to answer it the best I can. So I, I think that you mentioned that term superpowers before. So the dip in the universe that I want to make at the end of the day is I want to help as many people as, as I can use their superpowers for good. I kind of view myself as a, a, a Charles Xavier, <laughs> like in a weird way. I love it. That's, I want to be Professor X. At the end of the day, I want to help a lot of people realize that they have their superpowers and unleash those superpowers in the world. Now, what does that mean? It means that I want to inspire people to do what they're called to do. I think that you're, everybody's blessed with some kind of superpower. And what you do with your superpower is you help other people with the superpower. You don't, you don't, you know, don't use your superpower for evil. And so just like you, on the X-Men, you have the villains. Some people use their powers for bad. And so my, what I want to do is inspire people to use their powers for good. And what's cool about that mentality is that helps me mentor people. That helps me build an awesome company with awesome people. And then big picture, because I think very long term, right? What's going to happen is some of the people I mentor are going to build awesome companies. Some of the people that are on my team, we might build three, four, five companies together. I might be have an opportunity to invest in our company. They may have an opportunity to invest in something that I'm building. So it's, I think this is a big snowball and also showing people that you can do it the right way. You don't have to be an absolute jerk to win. You feel me? And so there's yeah. this, there's some people who think you have to be a jerk to win. But yeah, so that's kind of like what I want to do. I want to, I want to be able to, not so much the universe, but anybody that comes around me in my little, you know, my little gravitational force, right? I want to push them towards towards that. So that's actually what I see about my little universe. One of the things as you, as you were first building the company that I thought was so fascinating, and you see this stuff out in the ecosystem, but the way that you went about this idea of penetration testing and incident response and digital forensics and all this stuff about just helping people see themselves. And I think that that goes back to your, your superpower point is if people are building companies and trying to make a change and they're being bogged down with hackers or they're being attacked or they're vulnerable, they can't do their best work. I mean, like how do you help people do their best work and how, how do you at threat care help people keep themselves safe? Yeah. So at, at threat care, what we do is we, we automate some of that testing as you're talking about, we automate the processes that to check to see if we can steal data off your network to check to see if we can hack multiple machines on your network. And so I would say 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago or whatnot, some of this stuff was like dark arts and dark, like, like you, you were a magician if you could hack, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so part of the thing that I like to do is I like to make stuff way simpler. So instead of having to go to all these different people that have to do this, 
I wanted to automate that into the software because the truth is anything that you can do manually, especially with computers, you can automate it. Now, there's a lot of people that have don't change their ways over time. And so everything's an automated process. When I can tell you a cool, cool story, and this is how, this is when I was at NSA, I used to write code that made what I did faster. And I would work beside somebody that wanted to do the same job manually. And I was like, man, I don't know why you're doing that manually. And he's like, because I want to make sure that I'm doing it right. I was like, man, if you automate that, you're going to make less errors. <laughs> so, like, so I'm here to say, look, the stuff that we've been doing for 20 years that we can easily automate. And then so you can actually do what you're supposed to do instead of worrying about all that other stuff. So all, everything that you can automate from a security perspective, you should do that. And that includes testing. And so what we've done is we do, we do automated testing so they can find holes faster and patch them before the, the bad guys, the black hats uh, come and knock them. Cause they're going to come and knock them like the big bad wolf. I love that. And they are coming to knock all the time. Can you talk about like the rise of the black hat? I mean, we had, we had Ken Gonzalez on IT visionaries talking about how it's basically never been a better time to be a black hat hacker. Like you just all of a sudden woke up and you have so many things that you can now hack into. There's, you know, the famous story of, I think it was a casino that got hacked, or maybe it was a bank, mm-hmm. but got hacked through yeah. their fish tank. Um, that was a casino. Yeah, that yeah, was in Vegas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that it's, it's really this just buffet for, for, for black hats and that the good guys, and you know, his, his company invests in the good guys and gals. What does it mean to be like a black hat hacker in terms of like this opportunity? Like what should we, I mean, I don't want to be like do fear mongering here, but like what are the stakes? What is at stake here? Because I think we all, know, like as consumers, like, man, if I got my personal identity stolen, that's a really bad day. Like that's a bad month. That's a bad year, you know? But I think that conceptually, we don't really understand what is at stake with the amount of stuff and data that's out there. Yeah. I talk about stuff that people don't talk about. So I'm going to tell you like this, man. Uh, One of my best friends is from China. And when he was growing up, he's about around my age. So he was growing up the only option they had is work work for the government, right? And if you look at different countries in India, Russia, and, and Ukraine, and some, some of these countries, education means a lot over there. And so what they're doing, it's a lot of smart people over there. And those smart people uh, study engineering. They study computer science. But they don't have the job opportunities that we have in the States, Right. You follow where I'm going here? 100%, yeah. So when we think about, it's not some random person over there. These are people that the best opportunity that they have is to be a hacker, is to put food on their plate by taking from, you know, what they may see is America. We have this abundant culture. We have all this money. We have all this blah, blah, blah. So to them, just like, you know, I have a company. You know, I have, I have employees working for me. There's companies over there that their whole job is to hack stuff in, in foreign countries. So you have an option to put food on your table or Chan, my buddy, he's actually in the States now. He had to eat grass growing up, bro, because they didn't have no money. They had no food. And I've been to India before. And, and a lot of them are hurting too. Been in India, seen, seen it first class. Like they say, 80% of the population is, is below the poverty line. You think they're calling themselves black hats? No way. You know what I'm saying? They think that they're providing for their family. And just like we have defense contractors that are going to work for NSA or the CIA or all these other organizations, right? We, we have people that graduate from Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Cal Berkeley, Stanford, that are going to work for all these agencies. And, you know, maybe or maybe they're not hacking, right? You know what I'm saying? I can either confirm or deny. But <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that this is the new world that we're living in. And those people in Russia and China and India and the Ukraine 
and there's a lot of countries that I'm not missing, uh, that, I, that I'm missing here. But those programs are legitimate jobs in their country. They're not black guys. They're a guy that's going to work, feeding their family, or, or a woman going to work, hacking, feeding her family. And that's just the, the world we, we live in right now. So I would say because of that, because these people are, man, my, my buddy Chen is the smartest person I probably ever met in my life, by the way. You got a bunch of Chen in a company over there that are trying to hack the United States. Are you kidding me? That's crazy. And so that's what I like to talk about. Instead of like, like you got to humanize this. These are real people. They're smart and they, they're working like their lives in some cases depend on it. And don't, don't get it twisted. There are people that if they didn't do what they do, they would be in danger for their lives even. And I'm not even being grammatical here. We know what it is. Yeah. I mean, we, we used to talk about that in Afghanistan, the same sort of thing. It's like the opportunity to grow opium. It's like, it's not like you grow opium or you grow, you know, a different crop. It's like you grow opium or your family is going to be (laughs) murdered. You know, like there's not really an option there, right? It's like, there's people in positions of power that will extort and hold that over you. And you have seemingly no option, you know, and you have no access to knowledge that, it could be some other way. And even if it was, even if you know that, it, it, it doesn't matter. What Are you going to risk your entire family safety over that? Yeah. And so that's the big problem that we have. And because what happens is like intellectual property and all those things are, are big deal. And that's what we're dealing with. So the reason why that we, we're dealing with the problem is because of social economic issues that nobody ever talks about. But I believe that the best thing ultimately, like, because what we do at Breaker is we help companies protect and, and try to do this hacking and try to do all these things before those highly trained people, it's an army of my boy Chan, and he's smart as a mug. You, you're defending against, against those people. And how I position this is like, you definitely have to do that. And also at the same time, there's actually some legal stuff that needs to take place where you can't sell bootleg products in the States. But from an international perspective, the Chinese can bootleg anything and sell it in, a, in the many countries, right? Yep. So we got to have stronger international laws to protect the, the intellectual property. And there's also crazy a lot of stuff that you don't, you, when you talk about this cyber thing, one of the biggest things that I can do if I'm competing on a global market is to hack into your CRM and see who you're selling to. Yes. Right? And look at your sales materials. So it's not all just bootlegging and copying is like super deep if you really think about it. And uh, I hope I'm not going too crazy, but that it's like all these layers of why this matters. You feel me? And so that's kind of like what I like to talk to people about because it's not the, you know, white hat versus black hat conversation. It's like, this is deep. They're selling products against us. There is intellectual property. If they don't pack something, they, they ain't eating. <laughs> you know what I'm it's crazy stuff, man. Yeah. And, you know, it reminds me of the, uh, I don't know if you ever, if you, if you were following along with uh, the former GM of the Sixers, Colangelo, there are all these like burner Twitter accounts and stuff like that. And his, you know, wife yeah. was tweeting from burner Twitter accounts, all this, all this stuff and you know, <laughs> being this big news story, but it was more the idea that the crowd, like the Twitter verse, the NBA Twitter were able to just backwards engineer and triangulate all of this stuff this is just the crowd. Like that's just crowdsourced people being curious and finding stuff. These are not like trained professionals in any way. Right. So if you look at all that and you're like, man, if this is what amateurs can do that are non-technical, this is just by sleuthing. What can the technical experts do? And, you know, not to paint this in, you know, this isn't all doomsday. It's the fact that we have threat cares of the world and Marcus, the Marcus of the world and chance of the world that are on our side that are, able to keep this stuff at bay is so critical to our success because we need things like this to be successful. And you recently talked to 70 people that are, that are like this. You wrote a book called Tribe of Hackers where you talked to all these people. Tell me a little bit about this book. We started working on a book about a year ago. And what, what I was actually inspired by Tim Ferriss' book called Tribe of Mentors. And Tim Ferriss has access to all kinds of celebrities and, and, entrepreneurs and all that. And I was thinking to myself, because 
I have a lot of friends that are hackers and all that stuff and, and really good security people. And so I spoke to myself and I said, self, you need to collect all your friends <laughs> and yeah. do something like this for cybersecurity. And, and so that was the inspiration for the book sat down, I, I wrote a book proposal, I wrote all the questions, all the stuff at the front of the book, I wrote over a year ago. And I pitched it to a couple of book publishers and the book publishers at that time, I didn't get a book deal for it. Uh, so, Hard pass, uh, as they say. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, what's awesome though is that, you know, there, you can self-publish nowadays and I thought the project was, was awesome and I thought it needed to be done. So we, we self-published it we released it about three weeks ago and the book has been consistently in, in the number one, definitely ranked in the top 10 of all, like a lot of technical categories. And so the book is going viral. There, you know, there's people online taking pictures of the, their books and sharing their books and yeah, it's, it's actually going viral. And so there, there's going to be a lot more of these books. Uh, this book was trying to tell people how they get into cybersecurity because a lot of people don't think it's accessible. How do you get into, in, into cybersecurity, how do you get into cybersecurity and how do you make a career out of it and all kind of other tricks on what books to read and all that stuff. Uh, so this is going to be a series and we have five more books planned in the series. I love it, man. That's so exciting. And it's so, like you've talked about, you do a lot of mentoring and stuff like that, but this is really the one to many that is so exciting because you have the ability to have this tight knit network. And when you say, you know, you reached out to a lot of your friends, I noticed I did not get an email. I know I'm not a hacker, but I feel like I could have got one. I'm just saying, (laughs) I'm just kidding. But you know, you have this network of people and much like a lot of the stuff that we do here at mission.org, we want to be able to share one to many. And a lot of times these conversations happen in you know, basements or back rooms or boardrooms or wherever it is, and they're not happening for everyone. And specifically, not everyone in the US, everyone in the world, you know, like our podcast, I think this podcast reaches 140 different countries, uh, or somewhere somewhere in there, our producer, will, will, I'm sure ping me afterwards and tell me the exact amount. But this idea that access to really smart people that are doing what you're doing that have been where you want to be is now so accessible. Was that like exciting to be able to share this stuff to, you know, to future generations of, uh, of white hats? Yeah, 100%, man. I, I definitely think that about legacy and I think that, and that's a good thing. Like what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? So I'm on Twitter and I use my Twitter account as a part of my legacy for wherever my kids are. It's kind of morbid a little bit, but if my kids want to find out what kind of person I'm, they can just look at my Twitter feed. Right. Yeah. You know, cause like sometimes you wonder like, man, I wonder what my great grandfather thought about blah, blah, blah. I say everything that I want to say on Twitter. And so any of my kids is going to be in some kind of archive somewhere. They're going to know exactly what I was thinking about everything at the time. And I'm very open on my Twitter feed. And so also the, from a legacy perspective, putting something together like this and making an impact on the industry, because this, this book has already sold thousands of copies, funny enough, and it's like self-published, sold thousands of copies. I would say that like, I went to a funeral of, of somebody that was, you know, kind of, I was kind of close to him for sure. And I went back to my hometown, my tiny little hometown. And uh, people were, were giving, you know, speaking about him and all that. And some people had good experiences with him and some people had bad experiences with him. But I was like, man, like, you know, those people with those bad experiences are always going to, if they do think about them, they're going to remember that. And they said a funeral. And I'm like, man, how, how do I want people to remember me? And, you know, I've been working on some of these things for years now, but like, what's going to be my legacy? What's the biggest impact can I make on the future? My kids and all that stuff. And so in a weird way, uh, and, and uh, Gary Vanderchuk is somebody I watch a lot. Gary is, is hilarious. And Gary says one of the things he, he said, he, there's two things that I heard him say that really motivated him. He wants to buy the Jets. And the other thing that he says, he wants to help out so many people and so many people be impacted by his life. When he dies, he wants it to be like a national day of mourning and everybody can descend upon New York or wherever he's buried. 
that's the kind of impact I want to make too. <laughs> that's hilarious. You know, it, it's, it's funny. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I saw yeah. you share that. I saw you share that on Twitter and uh, I had a similar, similar situation with somebody in Oakland that I grew up with, like super similar situation where they just kind of, kind of fell down the wrong path. And you're just like, man, that's, cr- it's crazy to see these things kind of happen and, and unfold with people you grew up with, right? Because like, that's the thing. There's a great line in, uh, in Harry Potter where Dumbledore says something along the lines of young, basically young people don't know what it's like to feel old, but old people have to remember or basically a remiss if they don't remember what it's like to feel young. And I think it's just like such an insightful line and JK Rowling is just such a G but it's such an insightful line because like, that's part of the thing, right? Is like when you're young and you're out there, you're trying to make a difference. um, You have no idea what the future could hold. You're just trying to build towards it. But once you're at that point in your life and you're able to like, look back and reflect and say, wow, I need to be able to help other folks that were in that exact same situation, overcome those hurdles that could have stopped me or stopped people around me. And I think it's just, you know, I, I love your Twitter feed in general because it's it's just super like motivating, positive. But you also posted something with like photos of your grandkids a little while ago uh, and how different they look physically. I, and it was just something that that stuck with me where I was like, man, this guy gets it. He just totally understands that all the stuff and all the dialogue and national dialogue about all this crazy stuff. And it's like, man, we're literally 99.99999% the same. What are we talking about yeah. here? And I just think... I just, your, your ref- perspective has always been extremely refreshing for me. Appreciate that. And me and my wife, we walk every morning for about an hour together. And what, what we were taught, my wife told me something that is so true. Uh, my wife, she was a geriatric nurse. And so she said that a lot of times when you see older people, they're smiling because they, they know exactly what we're going to, through in life. Yeah. Just by looking at us and they're like, yeah, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, it's really like, true. Yeah, that is that is funny. And and that's why I seek wisdom so much. Is like, there's been people that have been through what you've already been through. And there's no reason why you, you should try to act like nobody knows what's going on. And and just, just be accepting of new knowledge and new information. And I, I, I certainly think that that's the biggest part of, of my life. Because I'm from, man, I'm... Super poor background, but one thing that I do is I I take in a lot of information. Bro, I, I got like 150 audio books, bro, and I listen to about pretty much all of them. I want knowledge. I want I'm a, I'm a seeker of knowledge, and and so we live in a time where all this knowledge is available. What's funny about that book, the Tribe of Hackers book, is this the number one book is like three weeks ago on self published, totally went viral on its own, and we released a a PDF for free and over 7,000 people has had access to that document. And like, that's crazy to me because it's people that we released the book for free and it's still being purchased more than any other book. I know. I, I saw somebody, uh, I saw somebody on Twitter that was like, Hey, I downloaded the PDF cause I wanted it right away, but I'm still buying it. <laughs> like stuff like that. I love it. And all the proceeds, 100% are going towards uh, a bunch of different charities that you have identified, which is also kind of part of, it's just very you first off of, but it's really cool to see that this thing is, is making an impact. That's the biggest thing about it is that it's twofold. It's making an impact. People are learning and people are being blessed by the book. There's people in Africa, just like you said, it's international. People are reaching out to me, DMing me. My DMs are always open. And they're like, look, man, this book's amazing. Guess what I needed? Blah, blah, blah. They're getting that for free. That makes me so happy. And at the same time, anybody that pays for the book, that all that money is going to charity. So we're being like a, a double blessing on both sides. So I'm excited about it. And it's awesome to see these unfold in front of you. Yeah, I can't wait to... Uh... I can't wait to read it. And we're going to link it up in the show notes for, for our IT Visionaries listeners and in our in our core mission newsletter. I wanted to get into the audio book stuff. This is the last few questions. We do a lightning round where we ask a bunch of uh, questions that I have not shared with you ahead of time that you have no idea what's coming. Lightning round, fast and easy questions, just like the lightning platform okay. by Salesforce. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. What is your favorite audio book that you've read recently? Sapiens. 
We get that answer a lot, man. That's great. What app are you using on your phone that's the most fun? Twitter. <laughs> Power user. What's your favorite time-saving tool? Delegation. Do you have a favorite use of like AI or chat bots that you've seen recently? Yeah, I, I like um, some of the, the, the chat bots that do customer service. We're a fan of that. It, it, it's helped, uh, helped us out a lot. So we use chat bots for customer support on our, on our site. Favorite team sports or otherwise? Grew up playing basketball. So I, basketball is my favorite team sport. You're still living in Austin, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, what's your favorite one day getaway in the Austin area? So if you're in Austin for one day, you, you would probably have to see 6th Street. 6th Street uh, is, and also, is great. Yeah. It is a lively yeah. place. Yeah. What's your best advice for a first-time CEO? So I'm going to recommend a book for this. Uh, yep. This is a book called Traction Traction by Gino Wickman. It's available on audiobook, and I recommend getting a copy. Uh, that book has changed our company. Uh, we've been using that book for four months now, and we live by that book. It's like a Bible for operating a business. So Traction by Gino Wickman. Check the book I've, out. I've read it, and it's great. Have you ever seen a YouTube video where the author of Traction and Eric Reese talk about lean startup and traction? It's it's like a uh, I don't even know. I mean, I don't even know how I came across it, but it's freaking epic. Is it good? Good in it's, a good way? Yeah, it's so good because they basically they talk about like, like where lean startup stops and traction begins basically it's freaking crazy good and like at the beginning of the interview they're both like this isn't probably going to make sense for a lot of people but uh if you're in this exact moment you'll totally get it sort of thing or something we'll try to run it down and uh and i'll I'll send you a link that's a great book i would i would imagine i would imagine that would be great a great combination because they handle two different things I think most most startups are focusing on, on product market fit, and uh, that book traction totally focuses on operations. What's funny, you need to be a good operator to actually to make it long term. So if, I would say if you want to have your if you want to achieve your vision, traction is amazing for operations and communications and achieving those goals. I love it, man. That's it. That's all we got for today. You got anything else? No, I'm good, brother. I appreciate your time. Thanks, thanks, sir. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you again to our friends at Salesforce. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps.